And then this booming voice comes out the other end. Hello, we have your people. We want $3 million by the end of the week or they die. And then the line ends, line cuts out. I was a police officer, I was a career detective in London at Scotland Yard for 16 years. And I was involved in counter-terrorism operations and other covert policing roles. And then towards the end of my career, I got invited to get involved in some kidnap for ransom cases. And then over the course of the next few years, I was exposed to a steady stream of kidnappings across London. Most kidnappings actually involve local nationals. And it's only a small percentage that involve expats, Westerners or business travellers. Uh, and it's rarely a case of in the wrong place at the wrong time. So basically it's someone planning it well in advance because they know that they're going to get something out of it. Yeah, if you think about it, actually taking somebody off a street, out of a car, off a boat somewhere, and then taking them to a safe location for weeks or months at a time without being discovered actually takes a lot of planning and preparation and resources. And so the kidnappers don't want to do that with somebody uh, who's not going to be worth their while to kidnap. The people who will do the kidnapping invariably are these gangs or groups who see it as a good, profitable business model for them. Um, very rarely is it ideological, and usually it just comes down to one thing, and that's money. Can you talk us through a negotiation case? Like, for example, what has to be done first? The first 24 hours of any kidnap negotiation is crucial. If we mess up the tempo or if we, if we get that wrong, it's really difficult to claw it back. So one of the very first things when I used to get the phone call would be to speak to the family or the company and a, find out what's happened to see if we've actually heard from the kidnappers. And then I'd reassure them, give them some initial advice and tips that if the kidnappers phone, what we need to say. And then we'd want to set up what we call a crisis management team. And this is about getting the right people sat in the right seats doing the right job. When the kidnappers do phone, who are we going to get to speak to them? Because I don't necessarily want to get on the phone to the kidnappers because that could indicate that they've got professionals involved and therefore increase the perception of the value of the hostage in their eyes. And once we've done that, then we work out, okay, well, what's, what's going to be our objective on the first call? And usually it's threefold. First of all, we want to reassure the kidnappers that we take them seriously. Then we want to obtain a proof of life. We want to know that they've, A, they've got the hostages, but secondly, that the hostages are safe and well. And then thirdly, on, the, on that first call, we want to set up what's called a call window. Because the last thing we want is that phone to be switched on 24 seven. Because A, we wouldn't get any respite, the family's nerves would be shot to pieces, and actually we want to be able to buy ourselves some time to actually get the money together as well. And so once we've done that, then it simply becomes a waiting game. But when that first phone call comes in from the kidnappers, it's a pretty, um, it's a two-sided coin in terms of, it's great that we've got the call, but actually it just becomes very, very real. And usually, usually that call will be, we've got your people, this is how much money we want, and actually here you go, you can speak to one of them now. In a hostage negotiating scenario, is it, if they're gone for months, is it less likely that you, that they're gonna be back? The amount of time somebody is held hostage isn't necessarily an indicator as to the chances of success. It, it depends on a whole host of factors. It depends on where the hostage is being held and who by. Particularly if there's a political angle to it, because it could be more than just a simple demand for money. There could be some kind of political component to that. So say, for example, just generally speaking, kidnappings in Mexico or Latin America are pretty quick. Whereas in Africa, 
they could be weeks or maybe a couple of months tops. But just the length of time someone's held isn't necessarily an indicator as to their successes of coming back or not. What was your hardest case or maybe the case that kind of stuck in your mind most? A number of years ago, I was sat in an embassy compound in a windowless room and about a week before, six people had been taken off a ship and are now being held hostage. We, so we thought. We hadn't heard from the kidnappers at this point. And I'm sat at this table in front of me, there's a, an old mobile phone. And I'm getting a bit nervous because we should have heard by now in this part of the world. But I get up, I go and make myself a coffee. And as I'm pouring it, in walks this man mountain of a guy. And he shakes my hand and he says, morning, Mr. Scott, why do the kidnappers not call? And I turn around and say, Mr. John, they will call when they are ready. We must be patient. And then we go and sit down. And it's as if the universe has been listening because, because right then the phone rings and everybody jumps, including myself, even though I've been in those situations hundreds of times by now. And so Mr. John looks at me and I'm using Mr. John as the communicator because of the language barrier here. But he's been briefed, he knows what he needs to say and he presses the green accept button. Hello, my friend. And then this booming voice comes out the other end. Hello, we have your people. We want $3 million by the end of the week or they die. And then the line ends, line cuts out. And then I look up and all eyes on me and this is the moment of truth. This is where all the preparation, the planning, the negotiation strategies, the emotional regulation, this is where it counts. And so what happens is over the next few weeks, we enter into a negotiation with the kidnappers. And my aim is to bring them down from the three million because there's no way we're gonna pay it. A, physically, the company didn't have the money. And secondly, if we just paid that money to the kidnappers, they're gonna think, well, that was easy. It's called doubling. Thank you for the down payment. Now we're ready to really negotiate. So we had to make sure they, the kidnappers felt there was no more money left. And counterintuitively, that actually reduces the amount of time the hostages are held. So anyway, the negotiations carry on for a few more weeks, but it's taking its toll on Mr. John. And he's become a broken man. And I know this, he hasn't shaved in days, he hasn't showered in even longer, and I'm sat next to him for 16 hours a day. And then on one day, we'd actually managed to get the kidnappers down to about $500,000 at this point. The phone rings again. Mr. John answers it. He knows what the outcome is for the call. Hello, my friend. Yes, how are you? Do you have our money? Please, you must be patient. This is a lot of money, we're a poor company, we need more time. And please, look after my friends, they're your responsibility. And then this voice just boomed out again, no, they're yours. The money in 24 hours or they will die. Then again, complete silence. That is until Mr. John's fist comes smashing down onto the wooden table. So I stand up and I step back as he stands up and steps towards me and says, how can you just stand there so cool and calm when my friends are gonna die? He storms out and literally for the next 24 hours, I need to work with him. I need to regulate his emotions. I need to validate where he's at and reassure him we're doing everything we can to get his friends back and he's the person that can do that. So we get him back in 24 hours later, he's suited and booted, he's had a shower, he's had a shave, he's a brand new man. So he sits down, call comes in, and we get a deal for $300,000. Now we need to get $300,000 in cash, in a bag, from one country, across the border to another country, out to where the kidnappers are, get the hostages back and everybody gets home safely without being interdicted by the local police or the military. 
attacked by rival gangs or anything else happening. So we find a courier, we get the money into a bag and he starts his journey. Meanwhile, the kidnappers are phoning in every four hours wanting an update. Four hours go by, I don't hear anything from the courier. Eight hours goes by, I still don't hear anything. Meanwhile, the kidnappers are losing it. They're going apoplectic. They think we're trying to rip them off. We're trying to ambush them. They're going to get arrested or killed. So I'm trying to reassure them, praying that the courier gets in touch soon. And after 13 hours, I get a phone call. And the courier's been interdicted by the local police who got wind of the money on the road and are now refusing to let him go. So again, it's all about problem solving and dealing with challenges when they show up, it is we managed to fly a tribal elder down, speak to the local chief of police, who releases the curry and the money, well, most of the money, and then I think, great, we can get the curry back on the road. But he wants nothing more to do with it, and he legs it. And again, as you can imagine, the kidnappers now, they think this is it. They think it's game over, and there's literally mock executions in the background on the phone calls. Somehow, we managed to find a second courier who is willing to take the money. He has to hire a boat, go out to a waypoint at sea, where another boat comes alongside him, counts the money. Five minutes later, another boat comes with the hostages that gets transported back onto the courier's boat. The kidnappers actually turn around to the courier and the hostages and said, right, we're going to escort you back to safety now. And here is a clean mobile phone that once you get ashore, if you get threatened, challenged into any kind of trouble, we will come and help you out and get you back to safety. And why would they, why would they give, the, give them the clean phone and kind of be so nice about it. Yeah, the, the, the customer service, the, the quality assurance by the kidnappers just made good business sense for them. Because these gangs, these organizations, they don't do this as a one-off. This is a regular business model and they want repeat business. And the thread that runs through all successful kidnap negotiations is trust. It's, and when you think about it, it's the most unregulated dangerous industry in the world, yet it works 93% of the time. That's the success rate for negotiations, 93%. Which just tells you that, it, that it's about building trust with kidnappers, who we've got nothing in common with, are doing things illegally and immoral, yet without that trust on both sides, this doesn't work. Did you ever have a negotiation case where people actually didn't make it? Touch wood, every case that I was involved in, the hostages came back every time. Although I was aware of cases where that wasn't the case, particularly where there was a terrorist involvement and often people won't come back, they're gonna get killed by the terrorists to prove a point, either as a recruitment tool or to demonstrate their capability of doing that. But in 99% of the negotiations I was involved in, it was a criminal motive as opposed to terrorist, and it was a business transaction. What do you think is the best part of your job? The best part of what I do is seeing the faces on the hostages and the families when they're reunited. There's no greater satisfaction knowing that I've played a small part in that, in essentially saving somebody's life. What is the worst part? When it's a long waiting game, we call it the crisis within the crisis, because about 80% of my time on a, on a case was spent managing my own side was managing the client, whether or not that was a family or an organization. Because if you think about it, you've got emotions, egos, internal politics, competing agendas, all coming into play there in what is, for most of them, 
the most stressful, highly charged situation they'll ever face. And so actually being able to reassure people, communicate effectively, and navigate all those competing demands and challenges on my own side actually required more effort and focus than, than dealing with the kidnappers. Overall, how do you deal with the kind of emotional and psych psychological pressure of work and how do you stay calm under pressure? I'd say the number one skill of all the top negotiators that I know, it's the ability to regulate, self-regulate their emotions and a highly developed sensory acuity, which really is a bit like a radar or antennae where you can very quickly tune into your emotions and other people's and then do something about it. We call it name it to tame it. If I can identify and call out any powerful emotions that I'm feeling, for example, or the person I'm negotiating with, either on the other side of the table or my own team, actually that just takes the sting out of it, it diffuses the situation and it allows us all to kind of move on with the communication. They also bring more curiosity than assumption to conversations and negotiations. With zero judgment, they can park their own ego, they're generally interested in the other person they're communicating with and over time they've learned to be pretty unflappable. They've learned to more often than not come from a place of equanimity and being grounded and calm at the center of the storm that's raging around them. It's every single day life will present you with opportunities to practice this stuff, to practice the techniques of demonstrating empathy, of validating of truly listening at a deep level, of reassuring and paraphrasing and summarizing, and above all, making the other person you're speaking with, whether it's a kidnapper, your teenage kids or your boss, that they are seen, heard and understood. And the best negotiators in my experience can do that. But above that, I think reading people is a skill that comes from bringing that curiosity, being genuinely interested in people, and over time, you notice similar patterns and themes about if you can get below the wants, go below the demands, and find out what somebody's real human need is, then you can start to influence and persuade and seek some kind of cooperation. For example, if the kidnapper says, I want $10 million and a fully fueled plane to get me out of the country, that's their wants, that's their demands but they're not gonna get that. What the needs are that lie behind that, they wanna feel special, they're significant, they want some element of control. They also wanna be reassured that they're not gonna get hurt and they're gonna be able to walk away from this negotiation regardless at the end. And I think based on that, actually spotting li liars, people who aren't telling the truth is difficult because you do get some very good liars. So I think there's two separate skill sets there. Spotting liars is one thing, but actually learning to read people generally is another. So my biggest piece of advice to people is to truly listen. Remember the golden rule of negotiation is it's not about you. And you've got to first seek to understand before being understood. Do you win all arguments in your personal life? In my head, I think I win all arguments in my personal life. The reality is different, I'm sure. Um, and my teenage kids have grown up um, knowing and seeing me do what I do for a living and they've probably picked up every trick and technique in the book. So they just play it against me every single time. Um, and I'm sure my partner and friends will probably say the same. And I'd also say is seek out worthy opponents. What I mean by that is seek out those people in those situations, they're gonna challenge you because that's where you know you're getting better and stronger and a more capable and effective negotiator. And also don't be scared, don't be frightened of making mistakes. It's just try one or two techniques at a time. 
and then over a period of days, weeks, months or years, you'll become the best negotiator you can be. Can I make one request? Uh, do you mind though if you, you sh I could be shot in the head and they then discuss this and the muller, another muller was discussing and they said, yeah, yeah, okay, uh, you, we'll grant you that. So then it's like, oh my God, so I am being executed.